Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Female Founder World. It is the most beautiful sunny Friday in New York. So I hope that the sun's shining wherever you are as well. Today, I had such a good conversation. It's with Sally Mueller. She's the founder of a brand called Womaness. And we'll get into all about her startup, which is a wellness brand that basically focuses on products for menopause and she brings a really interesting lens to this because of her background and her experience, which I actually spend quite a lot of time talking about because there's so much knowledge there that I wanted to grab out and unpack and share with you all and also selfishly myself. She worked at Target for years in the marketing team and she also worked for Click Media, which they're the people that do wear birdie. I think domain is like the living slash home lifestyle kind of vertical for them. And she launched Who What Wears fashion label into Target and basically was leading charge on that project. So there's a ton of stuff that you can learn about branding, the different work streams to focus on when you're launching a physical product. So she really breaks it down into kind of different work streams. You've got the branding, the marketing, product development, packaging. We get into all of that stuff, which I think is really, really helpful. So I hope you enjoy the show and leave a five-star review if you haven't already. What are you waiting for? It's how people find us and helps us get up on the podcast charts too, apparently. We were number 28 in the entrepreneurship category in Australia last week, which was awesome because we've only existed for like two weeks. So I'm really stoked about that. But let's get to number 10. Thanks, everyone. Before we kind of like dive into Womaness and everything that you're building, I wanted to go back a few years and learn a little bit more about your experience before you launched your company, because I know you do have a ton of experience in kind of maybe not the startup space, but you have a ton of knowledge from your previous jobs and your previous career that I think people will find really interesting in this conversation. Could you just give people a little bit of background? Yeah, that would be great. So I spent almost 25 years at Target headquarters. I was a merchant for the first part of my career in apparel. And then I moved over to the marketing team. And that was a really, really exciting time um, at Target because we were really paving a new path for the Target brand, like the overall master brand. So I was able to work on several exciting initiatives like Design for All. Go International, which was all about bringing affordable design to the masses and partnering with designers that, you know, really brought incredible cachet and product to, you know, people everywhere. So it was a really, really exciting time at Target. Left Target in 2010. So obviously about 11 years ago. And then I started my own business. I was always very entrepreneurial inside Target. And I felt the hunger to really take all of my experience and connections and start my own business. So I ended up starting my business and really wanted to help retailers bring newness to their assortment and really, you know, almost like move to the brand side of the business. And so I ended up doing that for a few years. And then one of my clients ended up hiring me and you'll see a pattern. I start my own business and then my client ends up hiring me. So I ended up joining forces with Who, What, Where, Catherine and Hillary, the co-founders of Who, What, Where. I know it very well. I think people listening will know it very well. Yes, exactly. So Who, What, Where is known for obviously this fashion inspiration, you know, daily tips and just great, great content, right? And a really incredible community. And my role was to help them extend their brand into product. So together, we created a line of product, pitched it to Target, and lo and behold, was able to get a deal done with Target. So we launched in 2016, um, a line of fashion and eventually added some accessories. We eventually even expanded into international retail. So it's been a really, really exciting time to be with Who, What, Where just an incredible company. So my whole career really in a nutshell has been building brands for women. You know, if you just kind of look back at the many different initiatives that I helped lead or, you know, some of the success that I had was all kind of sums up in building brands for women. So I think it was all very good experience 
that prepare me for this time in womaness. But as you said, you know, I have more, you know, obviously Target's a large company. Click is definitely was a startup at one point. By the time I started working that with them, I would not call them a startup by any means, but, you know, a, a smaller to mid-sized company. So creating a company like Womanist from the beginning is a whole nother set of exciting challenges. <laughs> I bet. I bet. A lot of learning, which I can definitely get into. Yeah. So let's get into that. Let's get into the starting a business from scratch. I'm, of course, like I said before, super familiar with Click Media and Who, What, Where, and have also been following what they've been doing. They've gone into beauty now. They've got the beauty line first, which is at Target, which is, you know, makes so much sense. They've built these huge audiences and then have created product for them. How did you come up with the idea for Womaness and what made you think that there was an opportunity in this category? Yeah. I mean, I was going through my own personal journey through menopause. So there was a lot of, you know, authenticity and just the idea of modernizing menopause. So my personal story was that I found myself at a doctor's appointment at the Mayo Clinic, which is, you know, is very renowned institution. And the doctor was giving me some, you know, great advice, you know, after she understood what I was experiencing, she said, oh my gosh, you know, so many women go through what you're experiencing you know, things like vaginal dryness and just kind of the usual symptoms that go along with menopause. It was nothing, you know, life-threatening by any means. And she really recommended that I try some products that I could buy over the counter. So I went home that night to look at the products on Amazon. And I just, I said to myself, no, I'm not ever going to buy these products. I mean, the names were kind of scary, names like Astroglide and passion. And I just thought, you know, the packaging seemed kind of outdated, maybe designed by men, no offense to our male friends, but it just didn't speak to me. And I didn't feel like I could trust the formulation. So for me, that was really my aha moment in a personal sense, um, and even a business sense that I wanted to tackle this space. So I started doing research on the size of the market. And that's always something I would recommend as you're thinking about, you know, as your audience is thinking about ideas, like start to do some research, even online of the size, potentially the size of the market. And what I found was 50 million women are going through menopause at any given time. And the number keeps growing every year as the population is aging. And these women have huge buying power. But most advertising is not even directed to her. So there was kind of like a twofold opportunity, right? There wasn't necessarily a menopause brand out there that she could go to as kind of her first line of defense. But also this woman, not just in menopause or women's health, was kind of largely ignored. And I just felt like, oh my gosh, there's so many women like myself that are yearning for products that have clean formulations, a modern voice, beautiful packaging kind of all the things that a millennial brand, you know, so many of these millennial brands are offering to millennials. How do I put that through a filter and make it relevant for women my age and do it in my own way, but, you know, really take a lot of those ingredients and put it together to create Womaness. So that was the genesis of it. My co-founder, Michelle and I knew each other for about 15 years and we decided to do this together, which has been amazing. I always encourage people to, you know, find a co-founder. I know a lot of women try to do it on their own and it is tricky. You'd have to really be able to trust your co-founder and feel like you're the yin and yang and that together you're going to be stronger. And Michelle and I actually never worked together in the same company, but I consulted for her a few times. So we definitely had professional experience together, but we had this mutual respect for each other. And just, I could tell I could trust her. And so we joined forces and, you know, soon after we decided to work on this, we started doing more research. And, you know, that's something else I really recommend is, you know, we didn't really spend any money on the research. We actually got together, you know, women we knew, asked them to bring their friends. And we started doing focus groups in New York and even Wisconsin and elsewhere so that we got a good cross section of everyday people or more sophisticated women, depending on, you know, where we were doing the research. And we just found so many 
incredible women that were so willing to give us great insights. And that really helped shape the brand as it is today. So that was really the first several months of developing Womaness. And then after we did the research, we really started to formulate our, you know, put on paper in writing what our brand was going to stand for and what it was not going to stand for. Because it's almost as important to figure out what you're not going to be as what you are going to be. How long was that process when you had the idea to begin with and you're going through kind of those focus groups, that research phase through to putting things on paper and actually externalizing your thoughts around this? How much time did you spend in that kind of phase? If I remember correctly, I think it was probably three or four months. And we also had a goal of when we wanted to launch the brand. So we had self-discipline to like hit that goal. And we always knew we wanted to launch in 2021. So we almost had a backup from there. When did we have to have the brand strategy figured out? When did we have to have product development started? So we knew enough to really develop kind of a general timeline. And that helped us really stay on track. And I think that's important too. Once you decide that you're going to do something, put a timeline together. And, you know, that helps keep you disciplined to stay on track. And, you know, we ended up delaying our launch a few months, but it, you know, that happens. But if you don't have the discipline to, to decide when you're going to launch, I mean, you can just really lose a lot of years, actually. Because, you know, we were both working, we both had other jobs as we were working, I was still an executive at Click or who, what, where, and, you know, was trying to do this on the weekends and at night. So it's important to, to really develop that timeline. I mean, I 100% agree with you. I think you can spend a long time kind of trying to perfect things and going around in your head and and speaking with your co-founder before you actually get anything out into the world. And that's when you get the real feedback about actually, is this working or not? You need to have it out in the world and are people buying it or are they not? But I want to know, like, are there any specific tools that you use to kind of put that timeline together? Are you using Smartsheets or Monday.com or anything like that to kind of actually formalize that plan? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, I think we were super scrappy. So I think we literally just used Google Sheets to start. You know, now we use more software to keep our team on track. But I would say at the beginning, don't drive yourself crazy. Even if you have just, you know, a Google sheet, it really helps you think about all of the work streams. And so that's what I would recommend is think through, okay, for us, we had to develop a brand strategy. We also had to come up with the name for the brand. And we didn't really want to start working on a name until we had our brand strategy figured out. And that was a long, long process and almost jeopardized our entire launch date because we couldn't get a name that we loved and passed legal. (laughs) So there's a whole art in coming up with names, by the way, because so many great names and the shorter the name, the more difficult it is to protect. So again, we had a whole like product development work stream. How long does it take to develop, you know, a skincare product? How long does it take to develop a sexual wellness product? So just knowing the lead time, knowing when did we have to start in order to even launch in spring of 2021. So that was really, after we did our brand strategy, we really started working right away on our product lineup. So we knew that we had, you know, we wanted to cover products across the major symptoms of menopause. And once we really figured out a specific product we wanted, like a neck serum, as an example, then we had to start thinking about, okay, where are we going to get the formulations created? Oh, we're going to have to go to a leading, you know, a leading contract manufacturer. So we ended up hiring a formulator that had connections to contract manufacturers to help us really think through the product the ingredient story, the benefits of the product. And then we work directly with our labs to really come up with the product formulation. So that is a really long lead time. And it even is longer now because of the supply chain issues that are happening out there. So, you know, in some cases, that's well over a year in advance that you have to be working on that. So just a really, really long process. But, you know, knowing your audience is coming up with 
ideas that are, you know, they may not be product ideas, they might be tech ideas, but just thinking about that lead time from inception, like the concept of the product all the way to the beta or the go to market and how much time that takes. And you really have to back up from your launch or you have to figure out when you can launch based on your lead time. So that's what we did. We worked on, you know, thinking through all of our work streams. So product development, packaging is another work stream that ties to product. You know, it obviously includes all the testing that has to be done. Marketing is another big work stream. So thinking about, you know, creating the voice of the brand, the content, when do we do our first photo shoot, all of that. So that really goes into the next work stream. That is very helpful insights. Yeah, hopefully that's some good practical know-how that I can pass on to your audience. Yeah, that's really helpful. So I guess the main work streams, when you look at it, it's marketing, product development, packaging, and then you've kind of done the brand strategy before you've gone into those elements. Just to double click on the brand strategy piece there, for someone who maybe is coming to entrepreneurship from, you know, they don't have marketing experience, they don't have branding experience, Obviously, you can hire people to help you with this kind of thing. But what goes into a brand strategy and what should you be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it starts with the consumer. Who's the consumer you want to go after with your product? You know, demographics, psychographics. It's also really helpful to think about the size of the market and your positioning within that market. So for example, for us, we knew that there was an overall, you know, these 50 million women going through menopause. We also kind of figured out the size of the market. So we figured it was probably about $150 billion market. Since then, there's been stats that are much higher than that. But we really wanted our fair share. We wanted to be the number one menopause brand in the market. So of the 150 billion, you know, we even said, if we could just get 1% market share, what that could be worth 150 million. So kind of sizing up the market along with the customer, you know, their overall spend on that particular product category, I think is really helpful. And then I would also say just what's the competitive landscape, right? Are you going into a industry that's saturated and you're going to stand out in some way? How are you going to stand out? Being very, very clear about your point of difference in the market. And obviously, hopefully you're going into a market that's not as competitive. But, you know, there's always room for another brand, but you have to have a really strong point of view and point of difference. I call it the POV, POD. <laughs> And so that's where we really started. And then once you figure out, oh, we're going to be accessibly priced, symptom-based, clean products, modern, you know, we had kind of all of our words on what our positioning is. Then we started to really think about the voice of the brand. You know, is this a brand that's, you know, there's some humor. What are the dimensions of the brand, you know? So I think it's really helpful to kind of put words on paper. Sometimes people do personas. They think about, you know, if this brand was a person, who would it be? (laughs) So it's really helpful. There's a lot of good tools online too. I would really recommend just honestly Googling, you know, just searching for like brand strategy documents. There's some really, really good documents out there. I always find them really beneficial. And, you know, don't drive yourself crazy, but it is really helpful to work on that. And I would say do it over a couple different sessions because it's good to sit on it and then come back and say, okay, this is where we left off. You know, a few days later, come back and look at it again, sleep on it, and then really make sure that it can stand the test of time because you're not developing this brand strategy for a flash. You know, it's really something that you want to live on for the brand. And there may be pieces of it that have to evolve, but the core beliefs and the core positioning should really be true even years to come. Because that's what you're going to base all of your investment on, right? You're going to invest product and time and maybe even, you know, obviously money into developing the product and the brand around that positioning. So it's really important to do your homework and feel like, like I said, it can really weather the test of time. 
that's really great advice. I was actually going to suggest the same thing, like just Googling those templates. There is a lot available online. I think HubSpot has some great free templates and even Coursera has like courses that you can audit that literally walk you through this kind of process of how to come up with your persona and yeah, they're free to audit. So if you're not sure where to start, I just think that's, there are so many great tools out there to, to get you going. Right. And then the other thing that we've done several times, and even when I was at Click, we created a Pinterest board, a private Pinterest board, and then we shared it amongst the team that's working on it and started to just put images, you know, images of the woman or the customer that we're going after, you know, what do we like from a packaging? Maybe you get inspiration not from food packaging, even though you're working on a beauty line, you know, different things can really help you just get your thoughts down. Cause I think the visuals do matter. Like I might say modern, but you might think modern is different than my version of modern. So the aesthetics is also really, really important. I want to switch gears just a little bit because you have so much experience getting brands into Target and obviously working at Target. And I think a lot of people listening probably have a dream of getting their own brand stocked in Target. So I think that we should spend a little bit of time chatting about that. What are the things that those kind of big box retailers are looking for, for example, in the beauty or the wellness category? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of similarity across the retailers. And I've pitched retailers in Europe and the UK. And I always, I always think the, you know, usually you're pitching a merchant, right? You know, versus a marketer, you know, usually the merchants are the ones that are deciding whether something new is coming in their assortment. And then if they think there's something in a a compelling idea with your brand, then they might involve the marketing team. But I think across the board, there's a lot of similar things that merchants look for, whether it's Target, Walmart, Ulta, you name it. So the first thing is I always like to do the homework on why would this particular retailer want and need our brand? What is the void in their assortment that we're filling? And really do your homework, go to the store, go online and really be able to crystallize that. I've even taken it as far as like showing the product in the gondola run, right? So they can see, oh my gosh, look at, you know, the more you visualize it for them, the more real that it looks and it's easier to visualize it being a real thing. (laughs) So I think the business case has to be stated up front on, again, what you're bringing to them. I think even the homework that you did when you set up your brand on what's the market size, your mission for your brand, all of that has to be included in your overall presentation. And then I I always like to have proof of concept. So the more you have things flushed out and you're not just going to the meeting with very high level ideas, it works so much better when you have things flushed out. So when we first pitched womanist and even other brands that I've pitched to retailers, I've had the product lineup, I've had the packaging rendered, and I might even have a gondola run or an end cap rendered so they can start to see it in the store. And even some marketing ideas, like what are you going to do to build awareness for your brand, to market it for them so that they're, you know, the retailers are not thinking, oh, it's great product in the packaging, but how are you going to build awareness and trial for the brand? So really thinking through the marketing piece as well. So, you know, you don't want your presentation to be 100 pages. You want it to be probably 20 to 25. So really boil it down, but be prepared to show, again, the positioning, the why, why behind the brand, the product, and then how it, the product and the brand is expressed in the market, I think is, is really my advice. Great advice. I also just wanted to clarify something there when you're talking about the gondola run that refers to like the shelving of the display in store. Is that right? The shelving and the display. Exactly. You know, I don't think at the first meeting you have to get into like margin and all of the kind of the details, you know, I think you have to know what your price positioning is, but you don't have to be like prepared to talk about margin at that point. I think it's also a good time for you to get information from the merchants as well. So that's my advice of how to be prepared for these retail meetings. 
The last question that I ask everyone who comes onto the show is to share a resource. So it could be a book, a podcast, a community that you're part of, something that's kind of helped you along in the process of launching your company and growing it over the last year as well. For me, the best resources have been my own contacts in the industry. And I think I just really encourage your audience to think about their own network because you might be surprised that you do know a lot of people that can help you and tap those people because they really do ultimately want to help. I mean, I've noticed that people really do want to be very generous with their time and all of us see our, you know, idea come to fruition. So it's, I think, been very helpful to do that. But in terms of like a resource, you know, obviously knowing that, you know, I've, I've joined some of the female groups like the Luminary in New York. That's a really great place to network and find other women that are like-minded that are probably also entrepreneurs and start to ask them, who do you use? You know, maybe you need a graphic designer, you know, what's the best graphic designer to reach out to, especially knowing you probably don't have a lot of money to spend you have to be super scrappy at the very beginning. So a lot of these other startup places, I think, like the Luminary it just attracts a lot of women in startup experiences. I think they know how to be scrappy. Great advice. I think that people underestimate the power of their network, for sure, especially when you're starting out. And if you're a little bit nervous about talking about your idea or you kind of wanted to keep it to yourself until you've proven it. I just think it's such a wasted opportunity because there are so many people that can help you make it better. Uh, and if you're just sitting at home by yourself, not telling your idea to anyone, not sharing what you're working on, then you're not going to get the support that you need and the introductions that you need. I agree, Jasmine. I think the sooner you, I mean, obviously you want to tell the people that you, you feel like you can trust them. But I think if you have a great idea and you've done a little bit of your homework, people are not going to copy your idea, right? Think about it in a positive way, assume positive intent, and they're going to probably actually help you more. And if they don't have an answer, they're going to recommend someone else that does. So definitely use your network. Absolutely. Well, Sally, thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing all of your insights. It's been awesome to hear about Womaness. Yeah. And if anyone wants to reach out, just find me on LinkedIn or email me at Sally at Womaness. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jasmine. Hi again, Jasmine here. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you tomorrow for another daily drop.